Father, we thank you, Lord, that even as we're praising you and singing praises unto your name, your Holy Spirit is here. God, and you're ministering to our hearts right now, Lord God. Father, our, our, our souls get dry and thirsty, Lord God, and you're the only one that can satisfy that, Lord God. I pray, Father, that we would all drink in of your Holy Spirit, oh God, right now. Lord Jesus, that we won't reject the drink, oh God, that you're offering us, oh Lord God, the refreshing, the renewal, oh God. Lord, the strengthening, oh God, that you want to do in us, Lord Jesus, we absolutely need you. We were singing, Lord, that we need you more and more. That's so true, Lord God. We need you more, Lord Jesus. But God, we need to open up our hearts more, oh God, to let you in more and more, Lord God. So Father, like we were singing, set our hearts on you, Lord God. Set our hearts on you, Lord Jesus. So that, Father, you can move freely, Lord God, and do all the things, oh God, that you desire to do in our hearts and souls, oh Lord God, so that it would be well with our souls, oh Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord. Continue to be with us, oh Lord God, as we bask in your presence. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. I want to talk to you uh, about, um, you know, when, uh, when you are facing difficulties or trouble, there are all sorts of help that we seek. There are influencers, people that tell you what you should do. There are people that uh, counsel you and tell you the right things to do when you're uh, uh, facing things. Is there an example of uh, women, men and women of God uh, in Scripture that we try to emulate them and follow their example? And, and we, we, there are so many stories of men and women that got in trouble and they, uh, God led them in the right direction as he led them in what to do, what the right thing to do is. But the Bible also instructs us of what not to do when we get in trouble. And I want to talk about that a minute. Um, there's a story in uh, the book of First Kings about a very, very uh, well-known man of God named Elijah. And Elijah was one of the uh, great men of God that we consider. Uh, God did so much through him, through his life, miracles, even raising someone from the dead when he prayed. And uh, one of the most famous stories was when Elijah prayed according to what God had instructed him to do and prayed that there would be uh, no rain for three and a half years and, and God heard him and there was no rain. And then after the three and a half years, God sent him back to open up the heavens, but there was a big event because the people of God, led by a wicked king named Ahab and his wife uh, uh, Jezebel, who had infected the land with uh, Baal worship and worship of Asherah, very sensual, disgusting uh, female god. And uh, the, the prophet Elijah was going to take care of business uh, according to what God had uh, showed him to do. And, and he challenged the 400 prophets of Baal that were there to a contest. And uh, we know the contest very well, if you read in 1 Kings chapter 18. And uh, the contest was this. There were going to be two bulls. And each uh, side, Elijah by himself, and the 400 prophets of Baal were going to pray to their God to see which God is real and which God would consume the sacrifice. And we know, as we have read the story, it's a very famous story, that the prophets of Baal went first. And for hours, 
They cried, they chanted, they danced, they cut themselves. And Elijah began to taunt them and saying, uh, maybe your God took a bathroom break. Maybe, maybe he fell asleep. And they finally gave up, and now it was Elijah's turn. And as you know, he not only uh, was going to call down uh, God's fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice, but he made it even more difficult. He said, fill the trench where the bull is with water and, and, and drench the bull itself with water. And then he called on God, and God did what he did and consumed the sacrifice. And then Elijah had the 400 prophets of Baal and some additional 300-some prophets of Asherah put to death. And then we read 1 Kings 19, starting in verse 1. It reads like this. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that, that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself when a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, brush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. So after this incredible victory and after being used powerfully, from the Lord, we see another side to Elijah. Now, I'm very careful in talking about him because he's one of my heroes. But the Bible is clear in James 5, 17 that Elijah was a man like us. We have to remember that. And he prayed and, and God held back the rain and he prayed again and God sent the rain. A tremendous man of faith, but he had... I love these stories because they encourage me right? That when, when, when I start to doubt, when I have trouble, right, I'm in good company and so are you. How many have had those moments where you felt weak, you felt like, man, I, I can't take this anymore. And so we have this story, but this story teaches us what not to do. I mean, I could look at Elijah's life and find a ton of things that I should do according to how he did them, but here are some things that the Lord is teaching us on what not to do when trouble or danger comes our way. First of all, we shouldn't believe the enemy's lies. Don't believe the enemy's lies because he'll come with his lies when trouble comes. All sorts of things. Oh, God's left you alone. Oh, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't care about you anymore. You're on your own. You better figure it out. It's curtains. That's it. You're done. 1 Kings 19.2, from what we read, says, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Lies. He was still alive the next day and the day after that. And the day after that. The enemy's lies are always there to try to intimidate you when the chips are down or when trouble comes. You can bet your bottom dollar that when trouble comes, you're going to hear some voices. And they're not going to be saying good things. How many know what I'm talking about? And don't we have the habit of, at least for a few moments, believing it? Sometimes, unless you get it, you can last a long time believing the lie and get depressed and, and, and want to check out. Those lies are meant to cloud God's truth. It's meant to cover up the truth of God. That's why we can't allow that to happen. It's meant to cause you to forget what God has done for you. How many here in this room can testify that God has done so much, he's been good? Raise your hands. 
The lies are, are designed to make you forget what God has done, even the miracles that he's done in your life. Listen to when the drought prophesied by Elijah came. Listen to uh, what God had done for Elijah, 1 Kings 17, verse 2. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Kiriath Brook, near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So when he had a called a, a drought in the land according to what God had instructed him to do, God had, was taking care of him. He sent him by a brook to drink water. And then, could you imagine being fed or seeing this sight of birds bringing you meat to eat so that you would be well fed? Then later on, the Bible says that the brook dried up. So God said, okay, now I want you to move. I've instructed a widow to take care of you and to feed you. So the lies that uh, the enemy used through Jezebel, Elijah forgot all about that all of a sudden. Because if he would have remembered that, he would have said, yeah, right. My God, the same God who fed me by ravens, the same God who took a widow who was not even an Israelite to take care of me, the God who kept me through the drought and the famine, is the same God that's going to deliver me from your hand, Jezebel. But he forgot about that. And they're meant to, for, to, to make you forget not only what God has done for you, but to make you forget what God has done through you. Many of you God has used to bless somebody else or to speak into somebody else's life or to pray for someone and see God deliver that person. Also from Scripture, let me read the account of what I said in 1 Kings 18, starting in verse 36. What God had done through Elijah. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are the God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me, answer me, so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Imagine God doing that through your ministry, through you. Imagine the scene there. Now, also, imagine the power of the enemy's lies. That after being used like that, a, a threat from the king's wife can make you lose it. That's why we have to be aware and alert and sober-minded at all times. Because the enemy wants us to forget not only what God has done for us, but what he's done through us. Amen? Amen. Also, when trouble or danger comes your way, don't isolate yourself. That's a go-to for everyone that starts having trouble. They isolate themselves. From the story that we were, read, 1 Corinthians, I mean, 1 Kings 19, 3 to 4, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness he didn't even bring his servant. Forget that it was just two of them. He said, stay here. And he went a day's journey. That means he walked for a day. He walked for 24 hours. He was far away from his servant and everybody else. He isolated himself. And isolating yourself is like whistling for the enemy to come and mess with you. Because he's looking for someone to devour. He's like a lion. And what does a lion look for? Whatever animal has isolated itself or the animal that can't keep up with the herd or the one that's injured and has slowed down. That's who he's looking for. The, the lion it, it does not want to waste energy chasing after a, a whole animal in the herd. 
So isolating yourself is like whistling for the enemy to come. First Peter 5, 8 alerts us. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Even when you, when you isolate yourself, you'll even pray the wrong prayers. What did uh, 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 Elijah pray in, in verse 4? It says, he came to a broom tree, sat down under, under it, and prayed that he might die. Oh, that's a good prayer. That's a faithful prayer. Lord, help me. Just, you know, help me kick the bucket right now. When you isolate yourself, you begin to pray negatively. Instead of praying blessings, you start praying curses on yourself. This is what happens. It leads to stinking thinking. He started saying in the same verse 4, take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. You know, you start feeling all kinds of sorry for yourself and comparing yourself to people who aren't even around anymore. I'm no good, I'm not... Uh, there's nothing good about me. I'm just like the people behind me who are no good. You just go down a, a, a spiral and keep going down. It will even lead you to think that you're the only one going through anything and that you're all alone. Nobody's with you. There's nobody left but you. All sorts of lies. In 1 Kings 19, verse 10, this is what when he finally, when God began to speak to Elijah after he restored him by letting him get some rest and feeding him, this is what Elijah's complaint was to the, to the Lord. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. First of all, he was not the only one left. As a matter of fact, when he first went back to confront King Ahab, he ran into a prophet named Obadiah. And Obadiah told him, hey, I have kept a hundred prophets of God safe in caves, in two caves, 50 to each cave, and I've been feeding them and taking care of them. So even with that information, he forgot about all that, having isolated himself, and he said, I'm the, I'm the only guy. Yeah, you are the only guy under the broom bush, in the wilderness, yeah, you're all by yourself, but there's still people of God. How many know that whatever situation that you've gone with, gone through, or are going through, someone has gone through it before? How many know that? In fact, somebody's going through it right now. There's nothing new under the sun. So when trouble or danger comes your way, don't isolate yourself. Don't believe the enemy's lies. And don't rely on your own strength. Tim, if you come. 1 Kings 19.4, again, it says, He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, he said. I have had enough. Don't pray the wrong prayer. You know, I, I, I've learned a lot about that one-letter word, I. Whenever I is inserted into your life, that's not good. Of course, you, I, have had enough. There's not much that you or I can take. But God didn't tell you to take it, did he? Don't pray the wrong kind of prayer. Don't limit yourself by your own limitations. How many here have limitations? I have a ton. There's just so much I can do. There's just so far I can go. But God didn't tell me to go as far as I can go. He told me to let him work in me to do what I can't do by myself. Apart from him, I can do nothing. With Christ, I can do all things. I have had enough. That's what Elijah was saying. 
But of course he had had enough. He temporarily forgot the God who was more than enough. You're not enough, but God is more than enough. You know, it's when you've had enough that God begins to work in your life. Because when you haven't had enough, you will try to do what you cannot do. It's, it's our human response. It's an instinct in us that we try to do all our life we do. You see, only when you're confronted with the truth of, of God, with the gospel, that you learn, wait a minute, you cannot do. I don't care who you are and how good you are, how much intelligence you have or how much education you have or how much money you make or what position you have in the world. You cannot do, when it comes to the spiritual realm and things eternal, you can't do nothing. You can't do anything. But when you can't do anything, remember that the God who can do everything on your behalf. I love what the Lord says in Jeremiah 32, 27. He says, I am the Lord. The God of all mankind is anything too hard for me. I love that he asked the question. The answer is not given because it's obvious. So let me ask all of you. If you believe that nothing is too hard for God, would you raise your hand? Okay, we're all testifying, okay? And I'm speaking to myself as well. If we believe that and it's true, then what is it that spooks us when trouble comes? What is it that rocks our boat when things don't look good? We were singing that God is good. How many believe God is good? We were singing about God's love. How many know that God loves you and me. He's proven that over and over. We know that he's creator. We were thinking about our creator. Forget the the little things that happen here. He created everything. So why do we get rocked when trouble comes? There's no need for it. Remember how God has strengthened you in the past. How many of you can remember a time in your life, I certainly can remember quite a few, when you didn't think you'd have another ounce of strength to go forward? But you found the strength in Jesus in you. We have to rely on his strength always, always at all time. We can't let our guard down for a minute. Imagine what a lesson this is for us from Elijah. After that whole episode of victory after victory after victory. You know, sometimes in the greatest times of God using you in ministry, you know, we're still made of flesh. We're made of but dust, like the Bible says. And we can get worn out. Anybody ever get worn out? Right? So then what do we do? Do we run into the wilderness? <laughs> or do we fall on the grace of God and say, God, I need help. I have nothing left. I have nothing left. I'm telling you, there's been times when I've had to minister. And I was sitting in my chair thinking, I, I, I don't, how am I, I don't have anything for myself, let alone for anybody else. But knowing for, you know, learning from all of my mistakes and learning about the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. He cannot be unfaithful. He can't. It's it's, it's an impossibility. Knowing that, I've gotten up. Knowing that he would be faithful. And found the strength and felt the Lord empower me when I needed to be empowered for 
what he had called me to do. If it was left up to how I felt, that's why you got to be aware of yourself. You know, when, when, when there's a, something to do, if, if there's a church service, if there's a Bible study, and, and uh, you know, oh, I don't feel like, oh, I just don't have it in me. You ever feel like that? And you think pastors don't feel that? What if when pastor felt that, he said, ah, I'm just not going to go today. Let somebody else. <laughs> no. 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 In a way, that's good. It's good to be on the spot. It's good to be on the spot. Because then you have to rely on Jesus. Amen. Amen. And when you rely on Jesus, guess what? He never, ever, ever lets you down. Not ever. And finally, when trouble comes, when danger is ahead of you, don't give up on God. In verse 5, the last verse that we read from 1 Kings 19, the Bible tells us this, then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. He had just prayed, just take me, I'm no better than my ancestors, just kill me. And then he fell asleep, having given up. But I love the second part of verse 5. It says this, all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. You see, because even when you give up on God, he doesn't give up on you. He has compassion on us. And even when you're done, God's never done. You know, think of it. If, he, if, we, if, we, if God was human like us, and let's say I had the ability to empower somebody here to do something great, and, and I was faithful to do it, and I helped you and everything, and then you came back and you're acting like that, what would I say? After all that I've shown you, after I fed you, after I had that woman take care of you, after I even raised somebody through your ministry, and after I made you look good in front of all of those prophets and everything like that, this is how you act? You're going to run from a Jezebel? Huh. Yeah, go to sleep. Stay there in the wilderness. Later, I'm going to go find somebody named Elisha. Yeah. No, but he, he doesn't do that. What did he do? Wake up. You get to eat something. And after, if you keep reading the story, he says, go back to sleep. You need some more rest. And then he fed him again. He took care of him. He, 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 he brought him back to physical health, to soul health, and to spiritual health. That after he was done in working in Elijah's life again, he used him to uh, do some ministry to continue what God had begun in Elijah before he was going to take him up. And he personally escorted Elijah to heaven in chariots. Isn't that awesome? What a God we serve. What a God we serve. So I want to learn from this great man of God's mistakes I've, I've done those and then some yeah. but that I would never do them again because I want to experience what Jesus came to die for he not only came to save me and to save you but he came to cause us to live in a victorious way against all odds against massive odds against us. God has been faithful. And he continues to be faithful. And he wants to show you how faithful he is if you would just let him do it. Yes. Don't believe the lies. Don't give up. Don't pray the wrong thing. Don't pray negative things. Don't isolate yourself. Stay 
in the herd. Amen. You know, perhaps, not perhaps, I know there's folks here going through some stuff. And the best place to be when that happens is in the body of Christ. So, whether you are or not, knowing the Lord, how he works, I want us to pair up men with men and women with women. And I want us to minister to each other and pray for each other and pray God's strength in each other. And we're going to move towards victory tonight. How many say amen? Amen. He gets glory when we move towards victory. So for the next few moments, find a prayer partner, men with men and women with women. Let's minister to each other in prayer for a little while.